Hello, good morning, Hillside. Welcome to the service this morning. It's June 27th, and we want to thank you for coming out and joining us this morning. And here we are filming in our kitchen, and you can see that there's a little bit of chaos here in the Brown household. We've been doing some home renovations, which meant we are taking everything from upstairs and bringing it into the kitchen. We've painted, we've redone the flooring, and now little by little we're returning everything to the order that we love so much. Yes, it has been quite a process, I would say, Heather, wouldn't you? It has been a process. And I think we're finally getting to the other side and so happy to be having our lives returning to a little bit more normal. Maybe there's a lesson in that. <laughs> I think so. This morning, Emily Jensen will be preaching from our sermon series called High Fidelity. Her sermon is on Joseph and his brothers. The passage today is from Genesis 15, verse 14 to 21. And I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation. After burying Jacob, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong you did to them, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Now don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Please join us in this responsive prayer. Open our ears to, to hear, hear your word. word. Open our eyes to, to see your presence. Open our arms to, to the, the embrace of community. community. Open our minds to, to the beauty of, of truth. truth. Open our hearts to, to the, the joy of new, new life. And now will you please join us in singing.
I thought you were You're bigger than I thought So I stop all negotiations With the God of all creation You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought you were God These past few weeks, we've been following a series called Hi-Fi Relationships or High Fidelity Relationships, fidelity being another word for faithful. We've learned from Keith and Ian these past three weeks that we were made in God's image and therefore made to be in relationship, that God realized that Adam or Adam couldn't take care of the earth by himself, that he couldn't exist as a human being on his own. And so God made a helper or a partner, uh, another person to be in a relationship with him. It's through God that we learn to love again and we learn to love properly. But we also learn a lot about love from our examples. As Keith pointed out, we get our first ideas about what love and relationships are from our family, from the examples around us as we grow up too from our friendships and from our romantic interests from our employers and as we become adults uh, from those mature friendships as well and those friendships teach us a lot about that betrayal and also about that love joseph was born to rachel who was jacob's favorite wife he was also the first one born to her even though she had tried for a while to have children and hadn't been able to so he was born to jacob and rachel in their old age and Rachel was, his, was Jacob's favorite wife. So that made Joseph also Jacob's favorite son. And then all these other kids were in the family from other moms that uh, were jealous of Joseph because of the favoritism that he had from his dad. We know the classic story of Joseph's multicolored coat that Jacob gave him, but it wasn't the coat specifically that the brothers were jealous of. It was actually the love and attention that they were jealous of from Jacob giving Joseph as his father. Now, that's probably a learned behavior. Leah and Rachel were constantly in competition and constantly trying to get the love and affection of Jacob. And so it would, it would make sense for Joseph and his brothers to feel a little bit of that dynamic and to know what it's like to, to not always feel secure in the love that you have from your family members. So a lot happened in Joseph's life and we can't go through it all, but we're going to do some summaries to bring us up to the point of an opportunity that Joseph has to choose between forgiving his brothers for something that they do to him or uh, taking revenge and using a point of opportunity to extract revenge. Now, as I said, Joseph's brothers already knew that uh, he was the favorite of their dad, Jacob. They see an opportunity to plot and murder Joseph. But then one of the brothers tries to save Joseph's life and says, hey, instead of us killing him, let's just throw him in this pit in the wilderness, and that way we're not guilty of murder, but we also get rid of the Joseph problem. Now, in that brother's mind, he was planning on actually returning to the pit later and saving Joseph's life, but one thing led to another, and some other people made decisions, and eventually Joseph actually got sold into slavery instead. This all happened around his late teen years, and he ends up in the house of Potiphar. Now, something interesting, and we don't know why exactly Joseph started doing this, but he um, followed and honored God. It says that people saw something in him. They saw that God was with Joseph. And because God was with Joseph, everything he did was successful. Not only that, but through his success and through his various ventures as a slave and later uh, things that also happened to him, he never takes the credit for his success. He always points it back to God and he always says, this is God who is doing these good things for me. It is God who is creating this success. 
you probably know this part of the story. One thing leads to the other. Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of all the land. He says, I'll be Pharaoh in title and in throne, but pretty much in every other way, you're in charge. Not a hand or foot will be lifted without your say. And so Joseph is in this amazing point of power. And at this point, he's about 30 years old. So a lot of time has passed since his initial betrayal from his brothers. And he's in this point of power and he could, he has the riches and the authority now that he could reach out back to his family and try to restore his relationship with them. But he doesn't want to do that. Actually, from what I can tell from this story, he actually wants to forget about his family. He ends up being given a wife and has two sons. He names his son very particularly based on this. In Genesis 41, verses 51 to 52, it says, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. So again, he's still attributing his success to God, but he doesn't really quite see what's going on yet. He thinks that God has given him all the success to help him forget the betrayal and the hurt that his brothers have caused him. He wants to forget about his family. And then to confirm this, his second son, it says in 50, verse 52, the second son he named Ephraim, and he said it was because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So again, he's not blaming God. He actually thinks that God is helping him, but he still wants to forget. He equates his family, his history to suffering, the land of suffering, forgetting my family. I, God has helped me. I've stayed faithful to him. And now that I'm in this position of power, I just want to move on and forget. But God had other plans for Joseph. In a sermon by T.D. Jakes about Joseph's story, so a Bible theologian named Mitch Chase writes a little paper about the reconciliation of Joseph to his brothers. And he cuts this up into seven scenes. And these seven scenes are actually based on something very significant and very human about Joseph. Each of the scenes is determined by points in time when Joseph cries. You see, up until this point, even though he'd been from age 17-ish to 30, through all these trials and tribulations, it's not recorded yet that he cried or, or wept, it says. So the first time we see him weep is actually the first time that he sees his brothers again after more than a decade has passed since his first betrayal, since them first trying to murder him and eventually uh, selling him into slavery. So he sees them and recognizes them, but they don't recognize him because he's living as an Egyptian now. So he secretly goes away and cries, collects himself, comes back, and uh, he actually does a little bit of trickery with them, pretending to be suspicious of them for being spies, and using that opportunity to actually get them to come back with his younger brother, Benjamin. Benjamin was special to him because Benjamin was the only other son of Joseph's mother. At this point, his mother, Rachel, had actually passed away, so Benjamin was a very special kid to both Joseph and his dad, Jacob. So one thing leads to another. They eventually agree. They go back to their dad, but then their dad says, I don't want you to bring Benjamin back because I've already lost Joseph. I've already lost my favorite wife, Rachel. I will have nothing left. I will die from grief if you bring him back because I don't know what's going to happen to him. And there were some problems with this. First of all, part of the negotiations with Joseph about going to get Benjamin was that they somehow agreed that one of the brothers would stay in prison under Joseph's watch. And so there was actually a brother stuck there still while all the other brothers went back home. Again, so much drama in this family, much like most of our families. And so the, the father, Jacob, says, no, I'm not sending you back with Benjamin. That other brother's going to have to stay there. It's not worth it to get rid of this guy. I love him too much. He's too important to me. Because Jacob still believes that Joseph is dead at this point. And so eventually the famine continues and is so bad that the family actually has to go back to Egypt. And so the brothers remind their father, Jacob, we actually can't show our faces back there again until we bring Benjamin with us. 
And so it came to be that uh, two of the brothers at different points in time promise to Jacob that they will be responsible for Benjamin's care. They will make sure that nothing happens to him. And this is important to remember. So because of those promises, uh, Jacob eventually does agree, and they go on back to Egypt and finally get the other brother out of prison. And then when uh, Joseph sees Benjamin, this is the second scene of him crying. He sees Benjamin, his own flesh and blood, his only other full sibling. All his other brothers are half-brothers. He sees his full sibling, his little brother, someone he hasn't seen in so long. And again, he's brought to tears. But once again, he hasn't told them yet that he's their brother. So he again goes away. He, it says that he looks for a place to hide. He goes to another room or like a secret place and he cries. And then he composes himself and he comes back. And once again, he pretends uh, to be someone that he's not. And once again, they still believe that he's just some Egyptian official that they have to listen to. And uh, he uses that opportunity to trick them again. And they end up being, have, being framed for stealing from his household. Particularly, Joseph has his servants frame Benjamin so that it comes to be that Benjamin's about to be taken into slavery under Joseph's household for stealing something which he didn't steal. And so because of this, the other, one of the other brothers that remembered the promise that they'd made to Jacob to protect Benjamin comes up to jo Joseph and says, oh, you can't do this, please don't be angry with me. I know that you're really important, but I promised my dad to protect this kid because uh, if he doesn't have this son, he will die. This is one of two favorite sons from his favorite wife. The other one is dead. And if I don't protect him, this, this father is going to just die from grief. And this is the thing that causes the, the big reveal for Joseph. At this point, he can't control himself anymore. And he eventually uh, tells them who he is, what has happened, and that he um, wanted, to, wanted to see his dad again. And so again... They go back, get the dad, come back again. Again, more ups and downs. Joseph has gone from the brothers trying to kill him to making a life for himself through various successes and, and, and misjustice. And now he's excited to see his little brother again, moved to tears several times. Eventually, he cries over his brothers. At one point, he hears them re remembering that they tried to murder him and feeling bad about it, and he feels bad about it, and it's all kind of, it says they talk, but we don't know what happened. It's all this crying and talking and drama, and not sure if we forgive you, but we want to be with you and all this. And so eventually, Joseph gets his dad back, and this is the fifth time that we see Joseph cry, when he finally sees his dad again. And his dad, after seeing him, makes a number of statements on his deathbed that actually establishes the 12 tribes of Israel through all 12 of the brothers, including Joseph, which maybe Joseph didn't realize how significant that would be at the time. He also blesses Joseph's children as well. But again, Joseph might not see the bigger picture of, of all this. Right now, he's just trying to figure out how to be with his family. And how many of us are just trying to figure out how to be with our family? We might know how God wants us to act, but we may not know exactly what he has in store for us in our relationships with each other. So uh, Jacob sees his son, his long-lost son Joseph again, blesses and gives prophecy and establishes the 12 tribes and eventually passes away. And this is the sixth time that we see Joseph cry losing his father he had such a short period of time with him before he lost him again and under such strange and dramatic circumstances so then after when jacob passes away his brothers once again are worried that joseph's going to be angry with them and try to take revenge on them so once again he has to actually remind them so in genesis 50 20 to 21 it says this but joseph said to them don't be afraid am i in the place of god you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. 
So it took a lot of effort to convince these brothers that he wasn't going to take out revenge on them. But it would make sense for them to be worried. Like, he had a lot of power and a lot of money, a lot of advantage over them. And they had done a really terrible thing. And how many times in our lives do we have the advantage or uh, we have the power to maybe get back at someone or do something to them? But we then need to take the opportunity to show them love instead. And we may have part of the picture of what God intends for us in that, but we may not have the full picture. The point is actually how we live when we're in relationship with God, when we keep our eyes set on Him and we give Him the glory for everything that we do and in every way that we interact with others, no matter how much they've harmed us. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14-21. to 21. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. We don't see others as we used to, and we also don't see ourselves as we used to because of Christ. And so the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. If God's not counting people's sins against them, how can we? And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Therefore, because of this, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who has had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so because of this, no matter what our history is, how we've been taught to love either good or bad, how we've been hurt by others, we are uh, confirmed to be a new creation through Christ and that we are brought back to God and not just a new creation but a renewed creation that we were initially made in, in God's image and it was just the evil of the world that changed us from his image to something else and it is through Christ that we are brought back into who that image really is and so we are then showing others around us who Christ is and also as Joseph was way back when we are also able to be used by God when he can entrust us with loving others that we will fulfill his will in how we treat one another, no matter what advantage we have, no matter how hurt we've been, uh, that instead of stomping down on others, we can actually reach down and pull others up because of who God is to us and what he has done in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Emily, for your message about the reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers. Now we are going to spend some time highlighting a few items that is announced in our newsletter. The first thing I want to do is to say congratulations to all of our students and to the teachers who finished this school year. It was not an easy one and we really want to give you all big high fives for getting through this very difficult year. The second announcement is from our elders and it's what we've been praying about for the last few months. The search committee has recommended a candidate for the lead pastor position to the elder team and they've made a conditional offer. The next steps are a candidating weekend on July 11th in which there will be two in-person worship services in the morning. After that, there will be a vote of affirmation. So please watch for an upcoming email that will be coming to you tonight, that's Sunday, June 27th, for more information about how you can register for this July 11th candidate weekend and those worship gatherings. We are so thankful for these new developments and we've been very thankful for how things have been opening up and, and the, the, the numbers of COVID-19 going down. In fact, uh, I'm, as of this week, going to have my second vaccination as many of you are probably also receiving that and it's it's making a tremendous difference 
These past few weeks, we've also been praying for uh, Doris Shepley's sister. And I'm sad to say, but her sister, Maria Stevenson, passed away just a week ago. And we will be praying together for Doris and her family uh, during this time. And also, for our prayer time, we are going to be praying for those in our city who are battling addiction and for the families that are affected by that. Uh, the rates of opioid-related deaths have increased uh, to record amounts over the past year, and uh, I've seen firsthand the effect of opioid abuse within our city. And so let's take some time to pray about that. Please join me now for our congregational prayer. God, you are a God of reunification. Throughout history, you have worked in ways to bring people together in often miraculous ways. We pray now for our church as we begin to regather again this summer in different ways. We also ask for a spirit of unity as we gather to meet on July 11th and vote on the lead pastor candidate. God, we are thankful for the reopening that we have been able to, to enjoy uh, new things and we've continued to pray that the number of COVID-19 cases goes down with more people get, getting vaccinated. The power of modern medicine is a gift and the power that drugs have is tremendous to protect, to heal, but it can also be abused and can cause distraction. And this past year, we are alarmed at the rates that opioid drug abuse has in increased and the lives and families this has affected. So, Lord Jesus, we pray for those whose lives are chained by the powers of these drugs. No one is too far gone to be rescued by you. Give us strength to advocate and support those who need our love to make it through the other side of addiction. Today we pray for Doris Shepley and her family as she has lost her sister. Help their family to continue to come together at this time and experience comfort remembering Marie Stevenson. Thank you for the teachers and the students who have finished up the school year. And we pray for a recharging summer with time to relax and recreation. We are your church, God. We love you and we want to serve you with our whole lives. Amen. There are big things on the horizon for our church. And I'm sure that many of you are getting excited for what's to take place in this coming month. We're entering in uh, step two on Wednesday, which means more things are going to be up, opening up. But for today, we are going to say, hope to see you soon. And I'm going to leave you with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a great week. Lord, I need you to help me to hold out. Yes, I do. Cause the mountain are too high. I need you to help me. Thank you.